With us today is Herminia Ibarra. She has written a fantastic book. Maybe you've read it. If you haven't, you should. Act Like a Leader, Think Like a Leader. She is the Charles Handy Professor of Organizational Behavior at the London Business School and a generally smart and interesting person. Um, we uh, have her with us today. Thank you so much, Herminia, for being on the Bregman Leadership Podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward. So so let's jump in to, I, I kind of want to start with what you start with, which is the outside principle. It's a word I think you've made up. But it's but it you know it represents a mirror of insight I think and if you could just share with us the outside principle, right? So the idea behind outside and it's true I made it up, is that so which, uh, which is we, good because it means you own it now it's your word. Yes, <laughs> we spend way too much time chasing that insight through reflection, through introspection, through looking inwards. And when we're at these kind of transition points where it's so clear that what got you here won't get you there to cite our favorite Marshall is that there is nothing you can introspect that's going to help you solve the problem. The only thing you can do is get out there and try some new things and get involved in some new activities, meet some new people. And in the course of getting those new experiences, you will have, you will shape your own thought process and it will come to change. You know, it, it actually reminds me of this. There's this um, uh, principle in Judaism when, as, as legend has it, as the, you know, as, as the Hebrew Bible puts it, the, the Jews were trying to, where God was saying to the Jews, you know, do you want to, you want this Torah thing? And they were, and they were asking, you know, the Torah, which is the holy book in Judaism. And they were saying, well, I don't know, et cetera. And the, and the words are, um, in Hebrew, na'asev v'nishma, which says, act and then listen. Like, don't understand everything before you act. Just follow it. And then you'll understand. Like we could talk about this forever, but instead just follow the principles and then you'll understand them and you can shortcut this whole process of perseveration. Yeah. I've been told this story before. So I have, I've been told that Judaism is very act like a leader, think like a leader. It actually is. Like when, I mean, I hadn't written this in my notes, but as you started talking, I was like, that's, that's, uh, it's very much a a, a sort of a principle in, in Judaism. You know, and it's so much even more so true when it comes to changes you want to make in yourself because you have no real idea of what it's going to be, what the the new and improved version of you, the more leaderly you, the more um, able to listen and engage with people you is until you've actually tried it and followed that path and come to it. That's when you know what it is, but you can't, if you wait till you have it all figured out, <laughs> you won't. Right. So, so let's jump right into the crux of the challenge of all of this, because everything that I, that I think about and that I do has to do with implementation, right? And, and, and the challenge of course is there's a reason we try to think things through before acting, which is that we're afraid to act, that ultimately thinking is incredibly safe and acting is incredibly risky. There's zero consequences to anything that I think, but there can be tremendous consequences to things that I do. And so the challenge of acting is that it puts us out there uh, with the potential for embarrassment, with the potential for failure. Um, Thinking doesn't expose us. So how do we overcome that fear of acting, especially with what you're suggesting, which is without thinking too much? Right. So the best way of doing that, it's kind of like the ultimate nudge, is to get yourself into a situation that forces your hand. Because otherwise, you know, it's really hard to go back into your work place the next day into your team into your project and be acting very very different and so that's why the first thing that I recommend I call it redefine your job but what it really means is make your job a portfolio of things that include other things that include projects that include something on the side that include maybe things you do in a different part of the organization or with different people and let that be a context in which you'll naturally act different because it's a different it's a different setting but if you're always doing the same old with the same people <laughs> in the same team in the same department it gets very very hard to move to action so give us an example, and, and, and maybe it's, you know, it's also one of the, the challenges, I think, in what you're saying to overcome is 
a lot of people that's that's how a lot of people end up with experiences of failure which is and you know you you said it beautifully our friend Marshall you know what got you here won't get you there that if I'm used to doing things a certain way with a group of people now if I'm going to change the context and I'm going to change the group of people I may really try to do the you know use what I know because that's all that I know and apply it to this new set of people and it doesn't work because it's a new set of people and I set myself up for failure so what advice do you have for people to succeed or have a chance, or how should they be thinking about um, approaching a new context? Right. So obviously, if you wait until you have a whole new context, a whole new job, it's hard because, especially if it's a promotion, it's got a lot of visibility to it, and everything is going to make you focus on what you do really well, which may not be as appropriate. But at least at a very minimum, that new setting has like a big neon sign saying it's a new situation. What got you here won't get you there. You might need to do something different. And so people do look around. And in fact, some are just relieved to be a bit more of a blank slate and be able to do things they've been learning but haven't been able to put in place. But I think the crux of the matter is what happens before those new assignments and are there ways to be developing some of these skills and some of these styles in smaller ways uh, and that's why I think it's so critical to have a professional association you play a role in um, some you know some group some people sign up for the some kind of uh, recruitment committee associated with their organization or they sign up for some cross-cultural thing now you know, with um, all of these different artificial intelligence things, some companies are experimenting with how to help people use their spare time to devote it to a project somewhere else that needs help. There's many things you can do if you're looking for a place to develop yourself, to explore and not just exploit what you already know how to do. And if you can manage some of that before the big promotion or before the big shift, you'll be just better prepared for it because you've had time to practice it. Right. You know, it's it's um, uh, one of the one of the things that you suggest in the book that's related to what you're saying is to focus less on achievement and more on learning, right? And and I think that's right. Meaning, if you change your whole mindset, this isn't actually about you know, it's like it's the Carol Dweck growth versus a fixed mindset. If you say, I'm I'm actually here to learn. Like I, I that's what I'm most interested in, and learning demands failure and so I, I actually will be embarrassed and I will make some mistakes and I will try and that's fine because then I'll just as long as I reflect on it uh, after the fact right you're not saying don't reflect at all you're not saying don't think you're just saying act first so that you have something to think about and the design thinking people are in agreement with you you know the same thing the, it's the same, same thing. thing it's the same thing I was in it's a like conversation fast with, prototyping with yourself right yeah I, I love that I love that so um but here's where it's a little complicated because we're learning for the sake of achievement, right? Like we're ultimately the goal is achievement, not just learning. Like we're like an organization puts us in a position, promotes us to a role. And if we're spend all of our time learning and not succeeding at all, then we're going to fail in that role and we'll be removed from the role, hopefully. Otherwise, we have that terribly named Peter principle, which is that people rise to their level of, of mediocrity. <laughs> um, I awful, wish we could... An awful name. An awful name. It's an awful name. Um, so I guess my question is, how do you help people when they really do care? We all care about achievement. How do you help us move away from that as our main focus and towards learning as our main focus, which feels very important? So as a starting point, I think it's important that you don't just compare yourself in this comfortable spot achieving versus in this uncertain spot learning and perhaps not achieving because um, you, you never stay in one place for a very long time. And so your organization will ultimately come to have more and bigger expectations of you because things change. And it's really hard to be successful with the same skill set for a long stretch of time today. So there are also risks to staying put. Right. Now, right. Yeah, so, yeah, for you sure. know, we're also not talking about leaps from, you know, being a marketing manager to being an astrophysicist. We're talking about really by and large 
either learning about things that are adjacent to your field, kind of in the near proximity, or we're talking about more about connecting the dots. So being able to operate more cross-functionally and understand how the different pieces fit so that you can think a bit more strategically. Or we're talking about a situation where you have to rely more on your people skills than on your technical skills. But these are all manageable things. And obviously, if we have mentors and people who help us and a network that informs us because the the sister piece to the redefined your job I call extend your network and that is extend the resources that are going to help you learn and inform you and be sounding boards and give you perspective and the information you need it's impossible to stretch and be successful without that. We're speaking with Herminia Ibarra about her book, Act Like a Leader, Think Like a Leader. Herminia is the Charles Handy Professor of Organizational Behavior for the London Business School. And uh, Herminia, it's interesting, this question of um, networking, right, which, is, which you've just brought up, which is about future focus, ultimately. And you talk about this in the book, that, that you know, we're building a network for some future payoff and especially if you're growing up in an organization and you've been an individual contributor and maybe a manager and you're working to leader, that um, there's an immediate payoff of putting your face into your computer and knocking out a bunch of stuff versus sitting around and talking to a bunch of people. And the, the, the new book that I have coming out in July is called Leading with Emotional Courage. And the underlying concept of emotional courage is you know, that, that the thing that stops us from doing things have to do with feelings, not, you know, if you think about a hard conversation that you need to have and you're not having, it's not that you're not having it because you don't know what you want to say or how you want to say it or you haven't had opportunity. It's because you don't want to feel something. You don't want to feel the rejection. You don't want to feel your embarrassment. You don't want to feel the disconnection or the... And, and I think networking is very much an emotional courage issue, right? Which is a lot of people don't want to walk into a room, don't want to start conversations with people, don't want to connect with people when they're not entirely sure and they're worried about all this work they have to do anyway. And I'm curious to get your view and be honest. Uh, you know, I mean, you've been, you're always honest, but, um, but you know, don't, you don't have to promote anything I'm doing. But I'm curious about your view around the role of, of mastering and connecting with the emotions that might get in the way of our how much emotional courage you think is necessary for this kind of stuff and and whether in your work it it kind of plays into a factor or there's another way around it or or getting your view no, i think I think that's a really good way of putting it because you know, in a way, it's like that that fear of public speaking that Trump's death. I was just death. thinking that. I was just you know, thinking that, right? It's, it's I mean, what could happen. You talk to somebody and they look bored, or they don't call you back, or but, you know. But the idea it, that it, most people would rather die than do what you and I do is sort exactly. of interesting. <laughs> Whereas what could really hurt you is being ignorant and being blindsided in a meeting. That could really hurt. Right, right. <laughs> and, and so, but, you know, I, I did my PhD research on networks, and so I've been teaching about it close to 30 years, and I've never met a group of students who don't have these emotional issues about it. They, it's awkward. It's uncomfortable. You know, they don't know how to do it. It's, you know, they don't like to talk to strangers. They hate that cocktail. You know, and it's, right. it's in part based on a very limiting view of who they are. Oh, I'm an introvert. I don't talk to people. And also a very limiting view of what it means to, to network. And I have to say, something you started out with um, is another one of those huge misconceptions. Because it's not like, um, oh, I'm investing in my relationship with you, Peter, so that maybe one year when you're at the top of whatever, you know, I can harvest that investment. No, absolutely not. It is much more immediate and agile. That is, I'm talking to people on a daily basis because as I bump into them, I can find out things that are quite relevant. I can also emphasize messages that I want to emphasize and kind of seed those conversations with those tidbits. And I learn a lot. And that's, you know, kind of that's how we work. And that's how we get things done. Right. So, you know, it is true that perhaps you went to school with somebody who ends up being, you know, I don't know, the person who will finance your company or president or this or that, that may happen. But the kind of networking that I'm talking about is much more immediate. It is a way of getting your daily work done. So it, but it's a little tricky because the, I know for myself, I'll just use myself as an example, which is 
I know <clears throat> that these kinds of connections and network is really important, and it, it is related to my immediate work. I'm not thinking about, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm not thinking about, oh, you know, someone's going to help me in my career 10 years from now. On the other hand, the challenge, I think, as I'm listening to you is there is the certainty of my to-do list, which is yeah. longer than yeah. I can accomplish. And, <clears throat> and I know that if I take two hours to sit and work through, there is the certainty that I will make a reasonable dent in it and that I'll achieve some things that I need to achieve. And there is the uncertainty that if I pick up the phone and I call someone or I connect with someone or I go to a dinner, et cetera, that it may or may not give me the information I need or increase my learning or et cetera. So I'm going from the certainty of knocking out a bunch of things on my to-do list versus the uncertainty of learning and creating connections that may or may not help me immediately. And I yeah. think it's very easy to default to checking things off our to-do lists. Especially if that's more habitual and more comfortable, right. one. And two, what you've just described is also what people describe. So I ask them, I ask my executives how they spend their time and how they kind of chunk up their time into things they do themselves, you know, the kind of the doing, the kind of getting by and influencing people, strategizing, developing people, how they chunk up their time. And of course, everybody always says that they don't devote nearly enough time to strategic things, that they get eaten up by the routine operational because of what you've just described, this immediate hit. But we all know that we can be very easily victim of that near-term immediate hit. That's what happens to organizations that become obsolete. You know, that is precisely the innovator's dilemma. And the same thing happens to us because after a while you learn nothing new. Right. You're tackling a to-do list that has become less and less relevant. Right. So it's, it is all about how we as people balance our explore-exploit equation. Right. So we've got to add value, we've got to perform, we've got to achieve, we've got to bring home the bacon, all those things. Right, right. But at the same time, we have to manage our own development, we have to learn new things, right. and we have to figure out what are the next things that we might love to do, because even if we're great at things, they might come to bore us after a while. And so we're always managing that trade-off. And how we do our work is one way we do it, but also how we invest in our networks is another way. And it's very hard to grow without investing time in the network around you. And it's, you know, and it's not just for the instrumental bits. It's also, and I know this from the work I've done on people making big career change, it's the people around you are kind of a mirror to who you are. They see you in many ways as you have been and not how you might project yourself into the future. They pigeonhole you and that leads you to pigeonhole yourself because nobody around you expects you to be capable of doing some of the things you might be dreaming about. It's and true. so it's really That's self-limiting. True. Right. It's, uh, it's, I, I was actually just remembering this the other day for some reason because someone asked me what I was doing and I was describing it. And, and I was remembering the first time, and you know, I'm, this is the fourth book that I'm coming out with, but I remember the first time I was, I was on a vacation with a friend of mine and we were, it was a ski vacation. We were in a hot tub and we were meeting some new people and they said, so what do you do? And I said, and this was before I had written any books and I said, I'm a writer and, and you know, we'd kind of talked. And then my friend, who has known me since I was a kid, you know, we, we used to ski race together when we were 12 and 15. And, um, after that conversation, he turned to me and he goes, you're a writer? And I said, I'm, I'm trying it on. Like, I think, I, I think I'm going to be a writer, but I kind of wanted to see what it felt like to say I'm a writer. And now I guess I need to write. And, you know, four books later, I think actually it was a pretty successful process. So, like, there is something around shifting self-concept and then trusting that you move towards those things that, you know, you, you know you want to do, even if you don't see yourself as having done them. Um, Herminia, thank you so much. The, you're, you're, there's a lot of wisdom in this book, and it's, you know, very, very much worth the read. And, uh, and it's, you know, this conversation we're having, it feels like there's a tremendous amount of trust that you need to just put into saying, I know this is right, even if it doesn't feel right in the moment, and I'm going to do it. 
and mm. uh, and it's and and you give a really nice structure for um, building that kind of trust. And and the book for me builds the trust too. So uh, so thank you so much for being on the Bregman Leadership Podcast. Thank you very much. Um, it takes emotional courage as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Bye.